Hi, my name is Robert Trio, and I work as a museum consultant in Hong Kong. Recently, I was asked by the Hong Kong Archive Society to present a workshop on digitization. This workshop was one of five workshops that was conducted at the Hong Kong Maritime Museum. In this presentation, I will try to recreate the workshop that was given on the 3rd of June, and at the end, I'll give you my contact information in case you would like to contact me. Essentially, the premise of this particular workshop was not to get too heavy into the technical side that digitization challenges can present, but instead provide an overview of what digitization is and also talk a little bit about how institutions, whether you're an archive, a library, or a museum, can create a plan and a strategy. So on the evening of the presentation, I set out an agenda, which I'll share with you. And essentially for this online presentation, I'll try to follow the same points. So because it was a live presentation and it was given in Hong Kong, one of the strategies that I had for the workshop was to try to create some local flavor into the discussion. And one of the ways that I approached this is by looking at food and the way that many people enjoy photographing their food. One of the things that I am going to argue is that the same reasons why people like to take photos of their food is the same reasons why people digitize their collections in museums, libraries, and archives. So essentially, to make a very simple point, people like to photograph their food because it's a way that they can share that food experience with others who may not be at the table. It is a way for them to document maybe a vacation or some other outing for a special occasion. And lastly, because food has a limited shelf life, digitization in a way captures the food at a moment in time in order to preserve it for a long time. So that's essentially my Hong Kong analogy. Digitization of food helps us to better understand why museums, libraries, and archives can digitize their collections. And I always like to make the important point that digitization is preservation and it is not conservation. And there's a big difference. In order so everyone is on the same page, so to speak, essentially what I'm going to argue is that digitization is the capturing of an analog or physical object in a bitmap or raster form. And essentially what that means for our discussion uh, on this program is that I am mainly going to focus on the digitization of physical objects, um, three-dimensional objects, ceramics, models, paintings, photographs, things of that nature, and not focus too much on the digitization of film or audio, which is also an important part of museum, library, and archive practice. So essentially, this is the definition that I'm going to use. I know that some people may have a slightly different definition, but this is an important definition in order to understand the context of what I will be speaking about tonight. I chose this particular slide as an example of digitization because in many ways it's sort of the perfect example. Uh, it would be the type of an example from a natural history museum that had an insect collection. And the reason why I really love this is because there's just so much information, not only just the photo of the moth itself, but the fact that they have the size at the top to tell you how large this moth is. And also, you can see the University of California, Berkeley, has put a lot of um, metadata um, they have digitized the information which they have collected about this moth through the years. So this is a snapshot that a scientist or a researcher could use 
to directly know what this specimen is in the collection and perhaps uh, help them if they wanted to then go to the drawer and actually take this object out. Now let's take a look at this one. In many ways, it's essentially the same. It's a photograph of a moth. But look at the two uh, ways that these um, digital photos represent the moth. I will argue that this, in the truest sense, is not digitization. This is an artistic approach of capturing the beauty of the moth. Now, the important aspect and the point that I want to make is that institutions that share information need the first moth and they also need this moth because institutions are not just a one size fit all. They need digital files for all sorts of different things. For example, if a museum on natural history was creating a coffee table book, this is the moth that you would want to show. If you were creating a citizen science program, like the University of California Berkeley did, and they needed people to look at objects in order to record information to collect everything about their collection, what you need is the first moth. So let's think about digitization is not just one thing, but it can be many things. There's the straightforward approach, and then we have this one, which is what is what I would call more of an artist, artistic approach. And finally, let's take a look at this slide. This information is essentially the same information which was in the first slide from the University of California, Berkeley. The information has been placed in a simple spreadsheet and it collects the information which was on that sheet. This is the type that maybe a citizen science program may collect. In the truest sense, this is also not digitization because it is not capturing it in that bitmap form. I also uh, want to point out, though, is that this is important information, and this is a digital file, of course. But for the definitions of uh, this presentation, it's not digitization. I touched on this briefly, but I'll take a few seconds to, to go over it again. Essentially, these are the types of things that can be digitized. The first two are essentially things that can be captured very easily with a scanner or a high quality digital camera. The digitization of film or audio can be more tricky often because you have to have specialized equipment that can play older forms of analog sound and film. So one of the things that I want to argue about is that digitization cannot be a standalone part of an organization. It has to include all people on staff and all stakeholders and that digitization has to be a larger part of an institution and I essentially call that a holistic approach. And here are the different elements that I just want to bring to your attention. So let's take a look at holistic digitization and I'll simply go around the circle and talk about many of these aspects briefly. At the top at 12 o'clock I have CMS which stands for Collections Management System. Collection management systems are essentially the intellectual control that an institution has over its collection. Many content management systems incorporate um, the ability to uh, add digital files to represent the actual item in the collection. How is digitization in your organization going to incorporate these into your CMS? Some institutions are also creating digital asset management systems. And digital asset management systems, or DAMs, uh, can be very powerful tools because they have the ability to publish and to render all different sizes at the same time. Um, at 6 o'clock on our diagram here, I had put IT infrastructure. An important thing to remember is that 
with the creating of digital files, where are they going to be stored? Where are they going to be backed up? Does your organization have a system that is connected to other systems? Do these systems incorporate digital files? A collections policy in itself isn't about digitization, but it utilizes digital files. So when an organization takes an object in, is that when the object will be photographed or digitized? Does the collection contain works of art which still um, have to be considered copyright or um, the artist uh, has restriction on how they can be duplicated? These are uh, um, discussions that need to take place. Finally, is the public going to have access to these digital files? Will other departments such as education or marketing have access to them? So even if a person is not in the collections department or an IT department, digitization can touch many different aspects inside and outside an organization. A digitization plan is very simple. You take your mission and your vision and you put them together. Of course, plans can become more complex. And in this particular slide, I have sort of the four elements that any project has. Scope, time, resources, and quality. And essentially, why I define these four is because depending on your mission and your vision for your organization, these are the factors that will affect how a digitization plan will take place. Now, just as a, an example, if your organization is a international or national focus, then the scope may mean almost all the things in your collection should be digitized. While on the other hand, if the scope of your organization or project is very small, small users or unique users, then the scope of your digitization plan may mean just certain items in the collection, sort of the highlights, if you will, will be digitized. So I just want to put that in context in order to better explain that every organization is different. They all have different missions, they all have different visions, and that a digitization plan cannot simply be taken off the shelf and incorporated into your own. It has to be your own, and that way it will reflect a policy which will be in your best interest. The last point that I will make here is that all policies should be documented, approved by management and your board, and whenever a policy is put into place, it should be consistently followed every day. Policies lead to workflow, and essentially what I'm outlining on this slide is one possible workflow that a digitization plan may follow. And as I said, this is just an example. All right, so let's go through the boxes, and once again, this is just an example. Digitization begins with scanning or capturing the image in a digital file, which is called scanning. Essentially, organizations want to scan as big as they can in an uncompressed form, which means usually TIFF or JPEG 2000 for um, two-dimensional objects. You then want to save the file using some type of internal naming convention that everyone is familiar with and is followed consistently. Then you want to save it or archive it. Now this is for long-term storage. So you probably want to save to tape or optical or something that's um, stable. Essentially then you have these digital files. You want to place them in whatever system that you have, whether it's your digital asset management system or if you're just using regular desktop folder systems, for example. It's often at this point that you want to create a different version, a derivative. Um, derivatives are usually smaller or compressed. 
As I mentioned a little earlier, many digital asset management systems do these um, heavy lifting portions for you. Um, you want to create some type of scale or um, let's say there's a policy at the institution that all your files are 1500 uh, pixels wide, for example. Uh, it all depends on your organization and its needs. Uh, assigning metadata to a digital file is uh, essentially like doing collections management, but the types of information that are pertinent to digital files opposed to physical objects. This will allow the file to be searchable and can be placed in uh, some type of setting in which the public or staff can use. And then finally, you've spent all this time creating these digital files. You want to send them out into the world so people can use them. So essentially, these are the nine steps which most digitization plans have. Once again, this is a very brief overview, and depending on your organization, you may follow a slightly different path. My former supervisor loved this quote from Andrew Tannenbaum, which is, the nice thing about standards is you have so many to choose from. And this somewhat speaks to the theme that I've mentioned before, and that is, Every organization is different, and of course there are universal standards. There are web standards, for example. There are standards that dictate, for example, the compression of JPEGs. But essentially, you need to choose the standard that best fits your organization. And to briefly go through this list, DPI, SPI is essentially dots per inch or samples per inch. This is essentially uh, what will dictate how clear or refined your digital photos will be. Compression, we spoke a little bit about this uh, before. It depends on whether or not an image is compressed or smaller or it is lossless, which means that it is uh, a file which does not contain any compression. Format essentially is how are you going to choose um, the format uh, for your organization. Um, for example, I was recently at a conference in which they had all different types of formats that included three-dimensional scanning and different things of that nature. Uh, cameras that were specially designed to rotate around an object so you can create a, a wonderful experience for your visitors. Essentially, um, you know, these are nice things to have but only if they fit into your organizational plan. Color fidelity can be a little tricky to talk about. Uh, it can be a highly sophisticated um, undertaking. I know uh, a gentleman, for example, in Taiwan currently who is doing spectral analysis of objects, which is so accurate that it's more accurate than the human eye can even detect. But can be an important part of research into collections. And finally, as I mentioned briefly before, with digitization, you have to take into effect that copyright should be uh, maintained, and especially if uh, you are working with art pieces in which the artists are still alive or it is contemporary art, copyright issues are an important part to make uh, into your digitization plan. Many countries and organizations have standards organizations. TELDAP in Taiwan is one of the best local standards. Of course, there are many in the United States as well. So I want to share with everyone a recent digitization project that I worked on, which was a partnership with the University of Kyoto. One of the most prized possessions in the Hong Kong Maritime Museum's collection is this Qing scroll, which depicts, uh, in part, one of the most famous battles that took place in Hong Kong waters. The scroll is 18 meters long, 50 centimeters high. And when you just begin to think about digitizing 
such a piece, you can see that um, you need very specialized equipment. You cannot digitize the entire piece at one time. And in order for the museum to digitize it correctly and then have it presented in the way that we want it to, we really had to bring in professional help. And that's where the University of Kyoto came in. They constructed a special rail system that guided the uh, scanner and it made approximately 157 passes over the scroll and then eventually all 157 had to be stitched together to create one large digital um, file. This particular project scanned uh, the scroll at 1,200 dpi and it had a very high color fidelity. Once in place, the museum was then able to use this, um, this file to essentially create all sorts of different types of presentations, including a 360 degree film. I'd like to thank everyone for watching this presentation and I will end by providing some contact information plus my website's address. Once again, this is a very uh, broad overview of digitization uh, and it certainly wasn't my intent to provide um, sort of a how-to guide on how to digitize uh, the collections, but just mainly provide a starting point for institutions who are thinking about digitization as a way to document and share their collections with the public and for staff and other stakeholders. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for watching.